Um, we're here in Bonnie De Luca at the Lazo Institute for New Paradigm Research, and Giles Hutchins has agreed to sit down with us and speak a bit about his work. So, Giles, why don't you why don't you frame first where you started your career and then what the transition was that brought you to where you are now? Okay. Um, well, my career has been business. Been in business for over twenty years. Um, firstly, with a management consultancy company, KPMG. Um, then I was kind of head of little sustainability. Company, a little tiny company. Yeah, yeah. And I worked. <laughs> Why, I mean, one of the world's largest construction companies. Consultant companies, yeah. I, and I advised a variety of different companies, from non-profits, uh, um, government organisations, right the way through to big corporates. Um, then I became head of global head of sustainability for Atos, um, an IT services company with eighty thousand employees. Um, so I worked with them globally. Um, but I have to say, all the way through that, my passion has always been, my love has always been nature, life. Um, so it was around 2005, 2006 that I watched a David Attenborough program on a Sunday evening in my flat in London, where my career was was all good, and you know, according to the normal um, society, I was a very successful person, lined up to become a. Uh, uh, a future leader, um, but uh, the calling of the message at the end of the the program was, you know, that if we don't deal with the, the challenges now, the the weight of unraveling of biodiversity on this planet is is irreparable. And I kind of convinced myself for many years that I was in business to learn, to watch, to explore, so I could transform business. Mm. And that was my calling just there. I, that I couldn't wait another ten years to become. CEO of an organization and then try and transform it from within, I needed to really get on with it. So your calling came from David Attenborough? No, my calling came from birth. Uh, uh -huh. I've had it all my life. Uh -huh. I convinced myself that I needed to be involved in business, which enabled me to go along with working in corporations. But then my second calling, if you like, yeah, was from David Attenborough saying, the time is now if we're going to deal with this. And that was in 2005. And I, I wrote a note to myself that evening after I allowed myself to cry for a couple of minutes just to allow some of the pain to come out. Um, and I wrote, we begin. And in the morning, I didn't need to look at the note. I knew what I had to do. And I, it hasn't been easy. <laughs> but um, a series of steps to really understand the challenges, to um, explore what's going on and, and how I can you know, what, what my gift is in, in all of that, you know, what, what my soul is asking me to do. So that, that was a, a process that's lasted many years, over 10 years now to, to now. In that process, I've written three books and, and now focusing around how organisations can be in harmony with nature, not just inspired by living systems, but actually are living systems and how we can become more human in those terms of the future. And you have a new book that's, that you've just published as yep. well. Could you share what that book is and what that's yep. about? Yeah, it's called Future Fit. Um, so it's helping our organisations be fit for the future to enable them to be able to thrive in these increasingly uncertain times. And that we do that with a, uh, a new approach to leadership, to organisational development, um, to the way in which we relate to each other. And I say new, it's new to our current paradigm, but of course it's actually timeless because it's the wisdom of life, it's the wisdom of our humanity, of nature, and it's the same wisdom that all the ancient wisdom traditions the world over refer to. Um, so it's about, about us peeling back the layers so that we can bring more of ourselves to work, so that we can be more purposeful, uh, we can be more passionate, more creative, um, more innovative, and that we can help our organisations become more like living systems, self-organising, resilient, adaptive, uh, values-based, uh, life-supporting. And how are you, what's the receptivity that you're finding in the corporate world for the, the sort of ethos that you're now bringing? Uh -huh. um, I'd say the receptivity is moving all the time. I, I, I'm, admittedly, I'm on a kind of vanguard, cut, cutting edge of the future of business. So it would be more comfortable for me to be in, in a bit from that. I would probably have, uh, I'd be working with more organisations if I was in a bit, but I've purposely tried to push the envelope. Um, but that said, uh, I think um, there are increasingly, just over the last five years, I've noticed more and more people really starting to shift into that deeper understanding that I'm exploring. So um, I think that's for two reasons, really. One, because the situation is such that people can't av avoid the problems anymore. It's pretty obvious to any intelligent leader or business person that the challenges are, are rife 
and that therefore we can't apply the same thinking to our solutions that created problems in the first place. They understand that, that we need to shift the whole, whole shift in how we think and how we relate in our organisations. That's the first thing. I think the second thing that's really shifting is I do believe that there is something bubbling up, um, something alchemic, something um, a conscious um, thread that's coming through um, in, in our understanding of how consciousness, how life, how um, we as human beings within our modern human world um, actually operate. And I think that's really, really interesting. So you've got leaders like Paul Pullman um, from big global corporates. You've got lots of leaders from social entrepreneur organisations, you know, actually starting to really get hands on with what it means to create vibrant living organisations that enhance life rather than degrade life. And so we've been speaking about that at this conference. It's not just about creating sustainability, but it's actually about creating businesses that bring something good to the world mm -hmm. from the world. Mm -hmm. Can you, I mean, are you seeing, um, I think what I was struck by today was the idea that it's more difficult for existing businesses to make that transition than for new businesses to be founded within that ethos. What, what do you feel about that? Okay. I think, I think, um, um, there are lots of things going on at the moment, uh, lots of different uh, shifts and, and catalysts happening. For instance, in HR, there's um, every level you look at really is, on, is right for, for radical transformation. So in HR, you've got uh, more and more HR leaders thinking, hang on a minute, this asset management approach to resources isn't working and that that was not why we were in our jobs in the first place and we don't have to be beholden to this model of short term profit maximization, how can, you know, we can create value in a different way and actually this is good for business in the long term and it's good for our people and it makes us feel more part of the solution, part of the problem. Uh, you've got people in organisational development, leadership going, hang on a minute, our leaders need to be completely reframed to be able to deal with the world we're in and by the way, that also enables them to be more creative and more the kind of leaders that we want to be working with. So. Um, in, in talent management, you've got the same problem. You've got people, millennials coming up and, and organisations wanting to attract and retain people that have a sense of purpose and that don't want to be just put into prisons. So, you know, there's lots of tensions happening, um, whether you're a big organisation or a small organisation. And some people would say it's easier if you've got a leader that's transformative, that's going to make change from the top down. Certainly that creates a certain field that you can make change happen in. Some people would say it's easier if you're a small organisation that can set up with that ethos, yes, um, or that you're a family-run organisation because you've got longevity. Um, plan. All of these things help. But at the end of the day, we can just start where we are. And we can create vortices of change in departments, in organisations. I've come across, for instance, in a big, big multinational bank, which doesn't have that kind of uh, um, conscious leadership at the top, but has, in particular areas, some really profound change going on, in particular vortices within that organisation. So you just have to... So you have, to have, you have a talent for actually finding what the, what the entry point into those organisations is in terms of the receptivity to this kind of conscious movement then. Mm -hmm. And part of this is... is, is as all developing our own receptivity. Um, one, so that we can be more responsive to change, and we can be more open to a deeper wisdom that's coming through in us, and uh, two, so we can be more of who we really are, so we can allow ourselves to come through. So I think this is a potentially liberating, really positive um, crucible it's a threshold that we're going through and it's immensely challenging and it's fearful, it kicks up all sorts of challenges, whether it be Trumpism or people wanting to separate or blame others and racism and all these things that you get and political infighting in companies and short-term profit and maximisation, all of these things. But it also um, it can be a time where we open ourselves up to a new way of doing things and liberate ourselves from what is quite a constraining way of doing business, you know, which actually undermines our humanity, if we're really honest. Much of what we do in our businesses today actually stifles our creativity, undermines our ability to think out of the box and uh, connect as human beings. So we've got an opportunity now, this alchemic period is actually creating the very opportunity to do things differently and bring more of our humanity to the table, which is what younger people want as well, which is what we all want, to be more purposeful in the workplace. What, what, where do you see us being in five years? If we were to have this conversation five years from now, yeah. 
where do you feel green people? I would think the conversation would have moved along. So um, the more mainstream people in sustainable business will be probably now talking about what, what I'm exploring around regenerative business. How can we be net positive? How can we create the conditions that are conducive to life? That will be the main area of exploration for, for the people who are pushing forward traditional businesses. People like myself or, or people at this conference that are more pioneering will have moved into the next stage, which is around you know, how can we actually be living um, and experiencing life, um, whether in work and play, because work and play actually ought to start sort of dissolving. Um, so starting to really channel a lot of, uh, challenge a lot of the dualisms that we still put up with. So I think things will shift quite quickly within five years' time. I think we'll have a lot more examples of businesses that are really doing it. But I also think there will be a lot of breakdown. Mm. And as well as breakthrough, there'll be breakdown. Just as the caterpillar, when it goes through a metamorphosis, it goes through a phase of breakdown and the structures will all dissolve. And that's when the imaginal cells form groupings which form mm. the caterpillar, which provides a shift in consciousness. So we need that breakdown, unfortunately, but it's not nice. And a lot of us will hold on tightly to what we know, the status quo, to prevent that breakdown from happening. And that's what you see happening politically, organisationally, um, in, well, in, in every aspect of life. So in those five years, whilst I'm creating a positive story about the change that will happen, there will also be lots of breakdown that will go on as well in power to that. And that will be interesting to see how we hold that tension. Well, it, it, you know, interestingly enough, in fact, the butterfly has nothing in genetic material in common with the caterpillar. So, in fact, the complete old system is dissolved before the new system emerges. So, do you think the same thing has to be true in business? I don't know about the genetic structure. I hadn't heard that one yes. before about that. Yeah. Um, I think um, we're still so much caught up in the bubble that it's very difficult to see beyond the bubble until you see beyond the bubble. I know that sounds mm -hmm. silly, but we're still talking about being beyond the bubble whilst caught in the bubble. Right. Um, so there's lots of discussions, but I think it's slightly unnecessary, for instance, capitalism versus communism or, or, or individualism versus collectivism is a kind of du duality that will drop away once you, <laughs> once you get beyond this bubble that we're caught in. Um, and that's difficult to convey using current language. Um, so uh, poetry, um, mm. artfulness within businesses, um, creative expression is a very powerful way to actually allow us to start unlocking some of that imaginal selves within us, within our teams, mm. to enable us to think differently and get outside the, the box. And that's some of the things I advocate in my work, is how to create more artful, um, uh, creative endeavours within corporate environments. Um, mm. and, and, Believe it or not, a large percentage of the um, of Fortune 500 are now embracing things like dance, mm -hmm. improvisation, uh, expressive art therapies. Um, and I see that as perhaps they're doing it to maybe enable people to be more creative so they can be more profitable, but it's unlocking something. And that, that will lead to stuff. So I think we're already seeing things, really interesting things unravel. And of course, add to that digitization the power of social change, of connecting and making things happen. And, and there's, there's a powerful concoction for change, as well as a powerful concoction for breakdown, which unfortunately I think is part of the process. You, you have small children, correct? Yes, three and a half so, or one and a half, yeah. So are you imagining the work world that they'll enter when they're of age, and how different it might be from the world that you entered when you were coming of age? Hmm. Um, imagining the future is an interesting one, because um, it's difficult to do. Um, I think imagining um, the emerging future um, within the here and now is, and setting up the right conditions for us to be open to the future in the here and now is, is a more interesting one. Um, I don't know what the future is going to be like in 50 years' time. I have been involved with detailed scenario planning with some big organisations where we've come up with different scenarios of what the world could look like, um, and I'm aware of those, but actually that's based on current knowledge being projected forward or, or looking at trends, the futurist trends, and it's, it, you know. Uh, I think it's more important for me to create the conditions for my children to be able to be open up, to, to be able to be open to the future. Uh, I, I hope that some of the work that I do um, um, may be of, of interest to them, but I don't, I don't care whether it's my work or whatever it is, but hopefully people like me and other people, and I know some older people as well who are grandparents, who are doing stuff that I think we won't see the fruits of, right. our children will. Right. 
because of how things go. Um, I heard this yesterday, people saying that part of this is doing work and not actually necessarily receiving the reward for it, or not actually even being able to see the fruits come from it. And that is a very, it's a great challenge when you're inside the bubble because you're not getting recognised, you're, you, you've made some sacrifices in your work and you need to still operate within the current paradigm of, of increasing bills and, and costs mm -hmm. and so forth. So that's a very interesting tension, but I really do agree with the statement, which is we need to have faith um, that we're creating the right vibration, for want of a better word, the right um, openings mm -hmm. for the future to come through. So that's the way I look at it, rather than saying this is what the future is going to be like now. I think all we can do is help create the conditions for a richer future to come through. If we keep on stifling it and closing it with our egos, with our power, with our control, um, uh, th th then we're holding it back. If we open up and allow through simple liberating structures and approaches that we can do in our organisations and conferences and communities, mm -hmm. then we are allowing a consciousness to come through that is always there, always has been, always will be, and is far more powerful than our left or right brain can, can comprehend to, to start coming through. And that's the kind of future, I suppose, I would like to be involved in creating. Yeah. And, and the two alchemical, alchemical elements of love and transparency, mm -hmm. where do you see those fitting into this new paradigm of business that we're seeing? Mm -hmm. Totally fundamental. Um, uh, this, many people talk about the shift from separation to connectedness or separation to interrelatedness or interbeing. Um, essentially, it's, it's really um, uh, uh, to love. Uh, people don't use that word uh, because it's, it's got funny connotations within the Western world, even though our founding forefathers, um, deep philosophers in, in ancient Greece, really understood the deeper qualities of love. And I think part of what we're going to be exploring as we go through the bubble and cross our own threshold and start seeing beyond the bubble is bringing back in an innate love that we all have as human beings and that will help us love ourselves, love each other as ourselves and love the world as ourselves because of course it, it all is and that, that, that requires a shift in consciousness rather than a moral duty to love others as ourselves and we try and struggle with how do I love my neighbour as myself, it doesn't make sense because we're seeing it in today's logic. Yes. Once you're feeling that interrelationality, which is what we've been talking about the quantum, um, this conference, um, then it's a different experience. So love is what provides that experience. So essentially what we're doing when we're opening up to life, to um, more of our wisdom, is we're opening up to love. Um, so loving ourselves, loving each other, uh, I wouldn't use this language with a senior business person, right. but essentially what I'm doing when I'm helping them connect their brains with their, 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 their hearts and their guts and their IQ and their EQ and their SQ and I'm, I'm providing activities for their teams to become more creative and more purposeful is essentially bringing love into the room. Mm. It always was there, but allowing our awareness to open up to it. So it's primary. It's primary to what makes us human. You know, we're, we're, we're deeply loving creatures. Um, that's one of the special things. Um, and the travesty of the current paradigm is that we're starving it at source. We're, 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 we've extracted ourselves from what Irving would call the Akasha field, which is actually where that receptivity of love lies. And by separating our sense of self from it, we're starving ourselves from love. So love becomes lust instead. It becomes um, a manifestation of consumerism or ways in which we can gain a fickle satisfaction because we're being starved from, from what love could be sourced when we're being more present. Well, I thank you for sitting down with us. And um, I think you're very well spoken about this shift in the paradigm that we're encountering. So I appreciate your sharing your knowledge with us. Pleasure. Thank you.